Hi, my name is Katie Ray. My son, Jackson Ray, we call him Jax, is um, our CDH champ. Um, he is two and a half now, almost three, which is crazy to think um, when we think back all we've been through uh, with his diagnosis and his NICU stay and everything. It's just mind boggling sometimes to see how far he's come. Um, we first learned about CDH. The very first time we heard those three little letters uh, was at my 20 week anatomy scan. Um, my husband didn't even go with me because we uh, had some complications prior to that that we were ruling out, which we were able to rule out by then. Um, so we thought there was nothing wrong. 20 week, we're just going to confirm he's a boy and simple, simple. So, um, I went in and, you know, had my ultrasound, we confirmed he was a boy and we thought everything was great. And then the doctor came in and said, something is definitely, uh, different with your son's anatomy. Um, we're not really sure if he has a hole in his lung or if he has something else going on, uh, he might have CDH. And so I was like, okay, like not really knowing what that meant, not really understanding the severity of it. Uh, so she said, I'm going to send you to the local children's hospital uh, to get an MRI and more invasive testing and they can give you a definite answer and we can go from there. Okay. At this point, I wasn't really worried, um, you know, a little bit, but not so much that I, I didn't expect what was to come. So a week later, I went to the children's hospital and had my MRI and I don't know, a handful of days later, I get a call. I'm sitting at my desk in the guest room of our house. Um, I answer the call and I'm watching my then toddler, Rosie, color on the wall with a blue marker um, as I was told that Jax had congenital diaphragmatic hernia. Um, and I remember thinking in my head, I'm always going to remember this moment. Every time I look at that blue marker on the wall, I'm always going to remember the moment our life changed. Uh, so the first thing the doctor asked me was, do you want to terminate? And I was like completely shocked into saying, no, I no, absolutely not. Um, without having any information, I was just couldn't believe that that was my only option. So um, fast forward, you know, I had meetings upon meetings and appointments and scans and we learned what CDH was. Um, and once we learned about the 50% survival rate and the chances of, you know, delays or death, um, I totally understood why she asked me that, the doctor. So long story short, obviously I didn't terminate. Um, but I'm not going to lie and say it didn't cross my mind. Uh, having Rosie, my then 18 month old, um, she was the light of our lives. I mean, she still is, but you know, we couldn't imagine bringing a complicated situation into her life. You know, we didn't know Jax yet and we were very worried that Rosie's life would be completely upended having a medically complex brother, a baby in the NICU, not really sure what that meant for our life. Um, and we were more most concerned about her and we just didn't know how that would affect her. But in the end, we decided we would rather have 30 seconds with Jax than a lifetime of wondering what if we hadn't terminated. So we pushed forward and I convinced myself that I had to have a positive attitude um, because if I didn't have a positive attitude how could I expect him through my belly to also have a positive fighting attitude I know that sounds silly but I really think it was a big factor in his fight um, so when we, um, we we scheduled our birth at Children's Hospital Philadelphia um, which is about an hour and 15 away from us um, so we're so lucky that we live so close to such an amazing hospital. Um, I actually opted to have a C-section 
um, just due to complications I had had with Rosie's birth. Um, so we scheduled it for May 18th, um, 2018. And I remember thinking it was so weird that I could schedule my kid's birthday. Like I got to pick it. So honestly, birth was pretty normal considering, you know, I was delivering a very medically complex kid. Um, the only thing, and maybe this isn't, this isn't normal at all, but, um, there were probably 30 people in the operating room with me. Um, so we had, you know, his, we had my team for my, um, C-section. And then we had the NICU team who was there to take Jax immediately, um, to get him intubated and prepped for the NICU. And then we had, um, Jax was a part of a few research studies that CHOP was, um, doing at the time. And so those teams were in the operating room with me. For example, one of them, we are studying the effects of, uh, intubating, so putting the tube down the baby's throat while they're still connected to the umbilical cord and giving them that extra boost of mom's oxygen um, while they're going through that. Um, so he was a part of that study, which that went swimmingly well. Um, but so all of those other people were in the operating room with me. So there was no such thing as privacy. <laughs> Modesty went out the window times 10. Um, it, it, was, it was a circus. But they were all very good about you know, telling me what they were doing, what they were there for, who they were, um, to the extent that they needed to. So, um, when Jax finally came out, um, you know, it with CDHers, the hope is that they don't cry. Um, and he didn't, he was able to be intubated right away. And so that was a, like our first little success. Um, but he was whisked away immediately to an adjoining room to get prepped for the NICU. So I didn't see him. My husband got a glimpse of him on his walk in, but, um, I had no idea. It was like, I gave birth to a baby and then he wasn't there, which was extremely difficult. I knew it was coming. I knew that that would happen, but it's still very weird. Um, so about 45 minutes later, I'm stitched up and they start to roll him out of the room to take him down to the NICU. And he, they brought him by my face, um, sorry, and a nurse was um, squeezing a bag um, to help him breathe, or to breathe for him, I guess. And that is all I remember, is seeing this nurse, like, squeeze life into my baby. That was probably the hardest of many moments to come, but it was very difficult to see that. So they wheeled him down to the NICU and I had to wait until I could walk to go down. So I had to wait for all anesthesia to wear off and everything. So about five hours later, we got to go down to the NICU and... The first time, the first time I saw him, I threw up <laughs> and it was the most visceral reaction I've ever had to anything in my life. It was just seeing him attached to all those wires and essentially not breathing on his own was something no no one can prepare you for um so it was a really hard moment for us um there were so many people in the room with him it was almost difficult to even you know say hi to him so we didn't stay long we went back upstairs and I began the process of mothering a baby that wasn't with me. So pumping, um, you know, dealing with all of the afterbirth without the joy of having the baby next to you. So he was born at 6.58 PM on Friday night and about five in the morning on Saturday. 
we're sleeping and I hear my cell phone ring. And I think, you know, hopefully it's nobody important, but I can't physically can't get out of bed if my husband's asleep. So then I hear our room, room phone ring. And that's when I knew something was wrong. So again, I couldn't get out of bed and my solidly sleeping husband didn't hear the phone. So the nurse comes in and she says, Matt, to my husband, Matt, they need you in the NICU right away. So we thought that was kind of weird. If it was, you know, if he wasn't going to make it, don't you think they would ask both of us? But still, it seemed very urgent. So Matt goes down and he's gone for probably 30 minutes and he comes back up. And he says, the doctor walked up to me and said, I need permission to save your son's life. I need permission to do whatever it takes. Which meant that he needed to sign permission for Jax to go on ECMO, which is um, essentially heart and lung bypass life support. So it was something that we were dreading. We knew his chances being a right CDH, we knew that they were very high of going on ECMO, but, you know, we still had hope that maybe he would be stronger. So Matt's, you know, he said, do I have any other options? And the doctor said no. So he obviously signed the paperwork and Jax was put on ECMO within 12 hours of being born. So the NICU in and of itself was an experience that you can never fully described to someone unless they've been there in the beginning I felt like I was in the way all the time like I felt like this is my baby but I shouldn't touch him I shouldn't you know um I shouldn't sit too close to him because the nurses need to get to him and that kind of thing it was very very weird it was very hard to form a connection with him knowing you know feeling like I shouldn't be there but the nurses in Chops NICU are absolutely phenomenal. Um, I love them all. And they made it so that I felt comfortable very quickly. Um, but until he was off ECMO, he really couldn't move. He was sedated. And he was on ECMO for 13 days. So 13 days of just seeing my lifeless little boy, you know, fighting to stay alive, completely doped up, was really hard. Um... I learned probably it took me probably a week to figure out like how I could touch him, like his little hand or his forehead without disrupting any wires or tubes. You know, you never know when it's first time. Um, but so 13 days he was on ECMO. So he got off ECMO um, on his due date, May 31st. And I remember them telling us, okay, he's going to come off ECMO today. And I was like, maybe we should just leave him on a couple more days. Um, it became like a lifeline for us. It was once we knew the numbers and we knew, you know, his pattern and how he was developing on ECMO, it felt very comforting to know that it was like his fallback. But he told us, you know, via his numbers, he was ready and the doctors believed that. So they um, did a, a, they did the surgery to remove his ECMO. And I remember there was a little boy across the hall from him who, you know, you you, know, you don't know stories of other people in the NICU unless you talk to the parents. But I did know he was coming off ECMO that day, too. So uh, all four of us were sitting in the waiting room together, just kind of like hoping that both of our outcomes were positive. And they were. Um, so he came off ECMO. And from there, he soared. I mean, I had never seen a kid fight like this kid. He um, had his surgery, his repair surgery at three weeks old. So up until this point, we hadn't kissed him and we also hadn't held him um, because we felt so nervous about giving him any germs or whatever. This was even before COVID, so we were even still nervous. Um, but the day of his surgery, I remember saying to my husband, I'm not letting my baby boy go into surgery without giving him his first kiss. So we both kissed him and... Um, the surgery was excruciatingly long. Uh, I think our surgeon estimated like three hours and it ended up being closer to six or seven. And my parents were there and our daughter was there. And so it was a long day of just hoping and praying that everything went well. 
So I remember seeing his surgeon walk out of the NICU and my heart just dropped because his surgeon is so stoic and very straight face doesn't really, um, he smiles, but he's just very all business. And I remember seeing his face and thinking of all times for him to smile, this would be the time to smile if it was good news. So why isn't he smiling? Uh, but he came around the corner and he said, okay, he did amazing. You know, he's, he's fantastic. And we joked, okay, he's ready for Harvard. And our surgeon said, no, he's ready for Princeton, which was his alma mater. So that was kind of funny. Um, and so after his surgery, he did get repaired with a Gore-Tex patch, um, which is just a synthetic patch. It's made of Gore-Tex, like, the, you know, every like jackets are made of. Um, he didn't have enough diaphragm to cover the hole with um, his skin or with his muscle, I mean. So he does have a Gore-Tex patch, but his uh, doctor, his surgeon, is extremely confident that it's not going anywhere, um, even though the chances are higher that he will re-herniate with a patch. Um, so the best day of my entire life, uh, hands down, June 16th, 2018 was the first day I got to hold Jax and he was still intubated, um, and hooked up to all his wires. And it took three people to put him in my arms. Um, I had to go to the bathroom beforehand and eat because I wasn't, their policy is that you have to hold for at least an hour, which I of course said, oh, I'm going to hold for eight hours. But you know, it takes so much to get them out of the crib and into your lap that, you can't do that at willy nilly. So took three people, they put him in my arms and, um, Jax, who was notoriously known for having a high heart rate, one that they could never really figure out why it was high. Um, no matter what they did, it didn't really come down. It kind of, he just ran high. Uh, the first time he laid in my arms, his heart rate stabilized and went to normal. Um, and it was just a really good feeling. Um, probably for him too. <laughs> So that was an amazing moment. Um, my husband got to hold him that day. And then um, on, he was extub extubated um, four, five weeks after he was born. And then on July 4th, he had no oxygen, none. He was breathing room air, which was a very cool moment um, to see him with essentially just like a pulse ox monitor on a feeding tube. He was super independent, which was perfect for Independence Day. So July 13th, um, we were told we got to bring Jax home. And I, of course, being the mushy one, wanted my daughter to be there for a family photo when we left the NICU. Well, it's probably, you know, I probably should have known that discharge isn't like a quick little thing. So we were there all day long and she was exhausted and we were exhausted. Um... But he finally got discharged and we took some pictures outside the NICU with our wonderful nurse who was like, let me take him, let me help you down to the car. And this was only eight weeks after Jax was born. And you have to remember, we were told six to 12 months minimum in the NICU because of his the severity of his CDH. Um, and no less than three doctors stopped us on our walk out and they were like, where are you guys going? Like, what, why do you have him? They were shocked to see that we were leaving so soon. And with only a feeding tube, I mean, he had no oxygen. He was on no medications. Not that they would have known that, but he was so stable and it was just incredible. So that was um, a really proud moment for me because I knew that it was all him. He was, he was fighting. Um, so we came home and life's been crazy ever since. <laughs> um how it's affected our family is obviously having Jax here is amazing. It's a miracle. I, you know, I've opened my eyes to a lot of things, um, but it, it, our family, he just fits. It's just perfect. Um, obviously having him here now, I would never even question our journey, but you know, there was a point when we thought that termination would be the best idea and I'm just so glad we gave him a chance. <sighs> um, he is two and a half. Um, he, we call him the little destroyer. <laughs> he is such a boy. He loves to build castles and tear them down, ram his cars into the wall and the dresser and <laughs> everything, your feet. Um, 
He is just a ball of energy. He is so smart and he's so lovable. He loves to cuddle, um, you know, any given time, any time of day, it doesn't matter. It's not like just when he's tired, he will cuddle, which I love. Um, he, <laughs> I wish he was here now. I did this video with no kids here, but um, he's just a fireball and he adores his big sister. Um, and he is such an animal lover. We have two dogs and three cats. And if it were up to him, we'd have a zoo. He loves animals. Um, and he's doing so well. He, um, flu and cold season is difficult. You know, um, if he gets a cold, it typically turns into a hospital stay for us. Um, just, to get some oxygen support. He still only has really one good lung. His right lung is still not inflating as what much as we'd want it to, but he has a lot of time for his lungs to grow. And honestly, if you didn't see his scars, you wouldn't know that there was anything wrong with him. He tires a little bit easier than other kids, but he is right up there. He wants to do everything with the big kids. He wants to be a part of everything. Um, and we don't limit that. We want him to do that as well. Um, so, you know, our hospitalizations, thankfully we have close children's hospitals. Um, they're always usually pretty quick. We know exactly what he needs. Um, we get in there, we get out and he's over the cold. And that's hard, especially having Rosie and us having to be gone, you know, if we're hospitalized, but it's Jax and I would have a thousand hospitalizations if it meant we had him. So, um, in terms of CDHI, CDH International, um, they have been so helpful to me in making me feel less alone. Um, I don't know what it is about parenting, but, and honestly, anything in my life, when I feel like there's other people in the same boat as me, I feel so much better. It makes me feel not alone and makes me feel like others are going through it. So I strive as a mom to be very open and honest on social media platforms about my parenting struggles. Um, you'll, you know, I'm the first to tell you when I fail, <laughs> um, because I feel like it is such a toxic environment to feel like everything's perfect all the time. So, um, CDHI, they always are posting journeys of kids, you know, Jax's journey or Megan's fundraiser or what have you say a prayer for this angel CDH -er. And I feel like that really helps me, um, just recognize that there are other families out there going through the same thing. Cause CDH is so unheard of and it's so rare that it's hard to find families. Sometimes if you don't know where to look, it's hard to find other people who are going through the same thing. Um, so that, that's been super helpful. And the app, which I love, um, cause I'm definitely more of an app person, um, is great. It has easy to access information. It's right at your fingertips. I absolutely love it. And I wish every organization would have an app like that. Um, so I'm a huge fan of that. Um, and in terms of, um, you know, volunteering or donating to support families like ours. First of all, from the bottom of my heart, thank you. If you've ever donated or volunteered your time or even just asked questions about what's going on with Jax, seriously, from the bottom of my heart, thank you for that. Um, there are so many complexities that come along with CDH. And like I said, even once, you know, they're, you're repaired, CDH is a lifelong battle. You know, whether it be a cold or a respiratory illness, it's going to be 10 times worse for them. So having support means, you know, having access to certain medical things that we might need. For example, when he was on an NG tube, um, we always had to buy Tegaderm, which is the tape that goes on his face and it's so expensive. So, you know, the people who were supporting us through that, um, it was more helpful than anyone would ever know. Um, but I just feel like it's so important to support families like mine, but also, you know, other CDH families, because it's very easily, easy to feel very isolated and it's easy to feel alone, especially when you go to a hospital that isn't your home hospital or you go to a hospital that's not your CDH hospital and they have no idea what CDH is. Um, or you 
talk to a pediatrician and you say, oh, my son has CDH. And they say, what's that again? And you have to explain to a doctor what CDH is. And you almost feel, even though you know your stuff clearly because you've been through it, you almost feel like you're making something up, <laughs> which you're clearly not, but it's, it, it can be very isolating. So just being there to support and, you know, learn about CDH and listen to people and listen to telethons like this or read posts about it. It just makes us feel heard. And I know when Jax is older, that's going to make him feel heard as well. Um, so I will use any platform I can to educate or, you know, spread awareness about CDH and the repercussions and everything that goes along with it because I want my son to one day, you know, say, hey, I have CDH and everyone know what that is and everyone know why it's important to fundraise and donate and do more research. So, but anyway, he's definitely going to have some really good icebreakers when he's older. He's going to have some pretty cool scars to show. Um, and our family has never been stronger, honestly. So we're so happy to have Jax. I'm so happy to have CDHI and this community. So thank you for your time and thanks for listening.